Sir. Judge, is real estate property tax constitutional and has it ever been taken to the Supreme Court? In my opinion, it is not constitutional, but I believe that taxation is theft. Uh, <laughs> Un un unfortunately, I am in a minority on that view, and the Supreme Court has upheld the constitutionality of real estate tax. Regrettably, that's the law at the present state, present time, sir. I ask, can you talk a little bit about the Article the First that would pr uh, provide us with a, an enlarging House of Representatives, and whether you think that would help uh, protect our freedoms? Having, you know, uh, yeah, you got it. Uh, you know, when the House of Representatives was created at the Constitutional Convention, it would, was never imagined that we'd be, you know, 330 million people. And it, the, the vision was that you would know you're a member of Congress, that he would be your neighbor, that you could go talk to him, that he worked among you, that he wasn't a full-time legislator with bodyguards and a staff and a bulletproof vest and all that nonsense, that the Congress would sit maybe one month a year and would really represent the, I'm talking about the House of Representatives, the, the will and the mores and the values of the people. What we have now are two parties and they do whatever their, their dictators command of it. So a larger House of Representatives where our representatives could come from among us. Could you imagine if one of you represented all of us in this room in the House of Representatives? We would love you. We would welcome you. You would know how we thought, and you would represent those views. We wouldn't even have to second-guess you because you would come from among us. I don't see this happening in the near future, but think of it this way. A larger House of Representatives would be more people to tell Nancy Pelosi and company to go take a hike. And don't misunderstand me. When I say and company, I mean the Republican side of the aisle as well. Yes, young man. Hey, good afternoon, Judge. Hello. Uh, I'm just curious. Uh, like, there has been some progress in repealing parts of the Patriot Act. What parts exactly have been repealed, and what parts are still in effect that are unconstitutional and that need to be? Well, I couldn't. I couldn't answer that question in the short period of time, and I've only talked about the self-written search warrants and the prohibition on uh, telling anyone uh, about it. Uh, none of the Patriot Act has been repealed. There are three sections that are, will expire with the passage of time at the end of this year and the same uh, human being who railed against those three sections when he was in the Senate now wants them reenacted now that he's in the White House. It's an example of power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. The world must look very different from 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. All you want is power to pull strings and control people. I do believe that the most horrific parts of the Patriot Act are the self-written search warrant and the prohibition on speaking freely. And I think those are the parts that non-lawyers uh, understand the best. There are a lot of other uh, parts of the, uh, the Patriot Act and related uh, legislation that, is, that are equally as horrific. I'll give you an example. The, the Patriot Act originally permitted uh, federal agents only to serve these self-written search warrants on financial institutions. And then on December 13, 2003, the President signed into law legislation that would change the meaning of the word financial institutions. But it wasn't in the Patriot Act. It was in a piece of legislation that had nothing whatsoever to do with the powers of federal agents. It was an appropriations bill for the CIA, which nobody reads because half of it is secret, and it's filled with dollar signs as to what they can spend on this and what they can spend on that. And he signed it on December 13, 2003, because he knew that something happened on December 12, 2003, 10,000 miles away, which once announced would divert everybody's attention from this legislation. He knew this event happened before the media told us that the event happened. The statute, which is the Intelligence Authorizations Act of 04, amends the definition of financial institution in the Patriot Act. One would think, wouldn't one, 
that a financial institution is a bank or a savings and loan or some entity to which we would repose money for investment or safekeeping. Not according to the federal government. According to the federal government, a financial institution is a bank, a savings and loan, a hotel, a restaurant, a delicatessen, a car dealer, a boat dealer, a jewelry dealer, a casino, a real estate office, your doctor's office, your HMO, your computer server, your telephone company, your lawyer's office, and that great financial institution to which we would all repose our fortunes, the post office. So you see, the basic statute was changed to enhance federal power in another statute where you'd never expect to look for it. It was found by a very ambitious young person like you researching these statutes about a month after it became law. By the way, what happened on December 12, 2003 that George Bush knew would overshadow no matter what he signed? We arrested Saddam Hussein. And if you ask your member of Congress if they voted for this expanded definition of the financial institution into an area that no one would ever contemplate would be a financial institution, it was a voice vote. So there's no record how, of how anybody voted on this. Do you see how insidious the government can be? It's almost like Stalin. Take away their freedom but make it look like we did it the right way. Good question. Thank you for it. Sir. Judge, uh, should health care reform be passed in whatever form? And it looks like they're, they're foregoing the public option at this point, but they are, it looks like they're going to mandate that people bought, purchase health insurance. Do you see any legal, uh, legal way to repeal this act? I mean, I've never heard of uh, anybody being legally forced. Well, to when you say repeal, you mean challenge before a court yeah. or get a subsequent Congress to... Challenge before in a court. Well, there's an article in today's Wall Street Journal written by two friends of mine uh, arguing that the uh, requirement for purchase is unconstitutional. And they lay out very nicely uh, the reasons. But the basic reason is if the government forces uh, you to, to separate yourself from your property, it's taking that property away from you, and the Fifth Amendment prohibits takings. So, of course, the government forcing you to buy something is unconstitutional. Now, people will say, well, what about car insurance? Car insurance is compelled by the states, not by the federal government. The states have different laws. They own the roads, and they have an obligation to keep them safe. But even they can't compel you to take out insurance to insure yourself. They can compel you to take out insurance so that if you hurt someone else, there's a pool for that other person to be made whole to the extent that money can make the human body whole. The states have the authority to do that. The feds do not have the reciprocal authority to do the same thing with our bodies. Look, the federal government had no interaction with individuals until after the administration of the worst president in American history and prior to his administration the feds only dealt with the states as states you didn't need federal permission to do anything the federal government didn't didn't regulate any private behavior whatsoever